The skydiving experience probably tops every bucket list and it's one of the most extreme and adrenaline injecting sport in the world. But what would happen if you skydive from outer space? The highest skydive in history was Alan Eustace's jump from 47.5 kilometers above New Mexico in 2014, breaking the record of Felix Baumgartner, which was 39 kilometers above Earth. Alan Eustace fell at 1,323 kilometers per hour, breaking the speed of sound and setting off a sonic boom that could be heard from the ground. Alan, however, did not begin his jump from space, but somewhat arbitrarily designed it line 100 kilometers above Earth, which is basically a stratosphere. But let's say you didn't listen to reason and decided to set a new record for the world's highest skydive. And in the interest of making your record tough to beat, let's say you use a diving board on the International Space Station as your launching point, 400 kilometers above Earth. To get started, you would need a spacesuit and some oxygen to keep you alive for the moment. Your first challenge upon leaving space station would be getting to where you wanted to go. You would be falling towards Earth just like the space station. But also like the space station, you will be traveling sideways at 8 km per second. In fact, you will be traveling so fast sideways that as you fell towards Earth, you would miss it. This is called orbit. A little confusing, but think of this way. Consider Earth had no mountains or air resistance and you fired out of cannon. So you skimmed over the planet 2 meters high going 8 km per second. Gravity would pull you down those 2 meters, but in that time you would have traveled far enough that Earth, because its sphere, had also fallen 2 meters. The ISS is doing the same thing, but just much higher. Once you left the diving board, you would not need any help falling to Earth. Gravity would already be taking care of that. What would you need is to help to decelerate so you would stop missing the planet as you fell. So let's give you some rocket boosters to slow you down, as a Soyuz spacecraft does on its return to Earth. As your speed decreased, you would hit that arbitrary 100 km marker above Earth. At this point, you will be falling at a blistering Mach 25. For those who don't know, one Mach is the speed of sound, and it's equal to 1,234 km per hour. So you will be falling at 30,870 km per hour. The fastest manned aircraft was the experimental X-15. It's basically a rocket with a cockpit. It topped out at Mach 6.7. Only it couldn't maintain that speed for long because the plane literally started to melt. You would be going a few times faster. Mach 25 isn't quite man's all-time speed record. That's Mach 32 that the Apollo 10 module hit as it returned to Earth. And Thomas Stafford, John Young and Eugene Cernan were inside the vehicle with the heat shield when they did that, and you wouldn't be. That poses a few problems. Mach 25 is 30,870 km per hour. While it's fine up at space station altitude, where there is hardly any atmosphere, as the air thickens up, you begin to slow down. That slowing down process would be painful, because the air simply couldn't get out of your way fast enough. This brings up a number of issues, and we will focus on the big three. The first issue is the g-force problem. You would be slowing down so quickly, you would temporarily weigh 2,048 kilos, a little over 2 tons. US Air Force officer John Stapp proved that you can withstand 46 g's for a brief moment. 1G is a standard sea level gravity, but 30Gs applied over many seconds, as you would experience, would be certain death. Your softer parts like your airways and lungs would be crushed under the G-load. The second and simultaneous issue you would experience is a turbulence problem. At Mach 25, the wind is moving so fast it will spin you around and rip you apart. When a satellite is allowed to slow down and fall out of orbit, it doesn't fall in one piece, it falls in many pieces. And that's a satellite, which is a welded metal. Its limbs are attached far more strongly than yours. Even rocks are ripped apart as they make their way to Earth. The third issue is the heat problem. All the air that couldn't get out of your way fast enough would get compressed. And compressed air gets hot. The SR-71's wings get 315 degrees Celsius, and that's only at Mach 3. At Mach 25, the air is hot enough to melt rock. To withstand this heat, space shuttles use tiles made of rock strands with a high melting point. In such poor thermal conductivity, they can be heated in a 1200 degrees Celsius oven and touched with bare hands. You would not have the benefit of a heat shield, so you would bear the brunt of it. The heat would carbonize your flesh at first cooking, then burning when there is enough oxygen, and finally vaporizing you at more than 1648 degrees. Vaporizing is another way of saying your molecules are broken apart into separate atoms, so 
you will become a chon. And that's carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen gas. But eventually, even the atoms of this gas wouldn't withstand the temperature. The heat would tear the electrons from your atoms, turning you into falling and glowing plasma. The good news is, your last moments would be spectacular. From Earth, you would appear as streaking flames across the sky, visible during the day and far brighter than any shooting star. Like a typical shooting star, no piece of you would make it to Earth, at least at first. Instead, you would waft about the atmosphere as separate bits of ionized plasma. Eventually though, your lonely nuclei would pick up replacement electrons and become whole again and sprinkle down to complete the highest skydive in history. Then because you have so many atoms in your body, after they have time to coat the atmosphere, at least one of them will be in every breath everyone takes forever. And one interesting fact, in 1967, a Soviet cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov just kind of fell off from the space. Before the launch, the system's preparation spacecraft itself was made in a hurry on the peak of the space race era. The whole program was doomed from the beginning and Komarov himself knew that it will be one way trip. For five hours Komarov circled the earth attempting to navigate home with a broken equipment and intermittent contact with ground control. He reportedly cursed and cried in rage. On his 19th pass he managed to fire retro rockets and re-entered earth's atmosphere. As the craft descended, the hopelessly entangled parachutes failed to deploy. The Soyuz 1 slammed into the ground. Nothing was left of the spacecraft or Komarov's body, but twisted metal, charred remains, and a chip of his heel. Just a reminder, when you're breathing, you might be breathing at least one atom of Vladimir Komarov. Well, technically, he might be inside of your lungs right now. Thanks for watching, support the channel on Patreon, and make sure to subscribe.